We farm turkeys and then we have 300 acres of corn, soybeans and wheat. The soybeans we roast here and then the corn all goes back to the turkey feed and the wheat we use for straw for bedding the turkeys. My name is Brian Steeper. I'm from North Middlesex. The biggest reason I got into roasting was because I wanted to branch off from just a regular farm, do something innovative, something different, and find a sustainable way for me to take over the farm, but not just your regular cash crop or livestock. I have a unique situation. I'm a pig farmer without pigs because I, I grow all corn for my neighbor and he pays me to grow my own corn and store it and deliver it to him when he needs it because he doesn't grow enough. And then I grow food grade soybeans. And the reason I do that is because I didn't want to have two Roundup Ready crops. So I'm David Bolton. My wife Cheryl and I own and operate Seldom Rest Family Farms. We're in Adelaide Metcalf. We farm fuel crops, corn, soybeans, and wheat. Uh, I crop about 700 acres and then I do another seven or 800 custom combining. About 50% of what we farm is organic. We got started farming organic because a farm came available to rent and we were young and looking to expand so we said okay yeah we'll keep it organic in order to get that one and as we've worked with it I've liked a lot of the practices and they've worked out pretty good and we've actually continued to grow the organic as we go forward. My name is Jason O'Neill. We farm in Middlesex Centre and North Middlesex. I was an auto mechanic at first and my father asked me if I wanted to join him to grow some ginseng. So that's been back in 1992 he approached me. A lot of components had to be manufactured and made at that time. I was mechanically inclined so I did a lot of the, the modifications. My name is Mario Slagers and I farm here in Strathroy Caradoc. So we've grown from a traditional kind of five week season of strawberries to going to five months. Along the way they picked up raspberries. Back when I was a kid I used to take credit for that, that I liked raspberries so much. I said, Dad would you grow some raspberries for me and the way he framed it that's why he did it. Now that I've come onto the farm I've brought on beekeeping and honey and honey products and also making hard cider. My name is Tom Heeman and I farm in Thames Centre. We started with a small square hay and then as that got going we grew into more cash crops and picked up more acres. We got doing more and more organic corn and soybeans and every year we had a bit more and then in 2020 we grew into the dairy. Right now we're milking between 45 and 50 cows. There's a bad amino acid called trypsin naturally in soybeans and it'll kill poultry and pigs. So the biggest thing I'm doing is just cooking that out. The beans get augered into the roaster. That's set at a certain temperature. And then they're in a drum that spins around. They get roasted and then they come out and I cool them down. From there, typically they just go straight to the farm. They come in as a full bean and go out as a full bean. They're just heat treated. I traditionally grow a four-year-old crop of ginseng, what we consider a four-year-old crop. It takes six years to grow a four-year-old crop. There's seed preparation, stratification involved, seed processing. There's also land preparation and of course the erection of the structure. That all takes time before we can seed the garden. The following year after we seed it is when the first seedlings will come up, usually around the beginning of May, end of April. Mostly my custom work is combining, but I do have a couple of customers that I do planting and harvest for. When we bale in the field, we use a Coons accumulator system, which drops 15 bales together, but doesn't band them at all. And then we can pick them up with our loader, and we stack them in the shed that way. And then when we go to export them, then we throw them into a bale barren and package them in 21 bale bundles for easier loading and unloading in the truck, both on our end and at the customer and we can get more in the truck that way. I would say about a quarter of our hay is sold to local stables and three quarters gets exported to the states. We've shipped into Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, Georgia, North Carolina, Florida. 
The majority of my ginseng does get shipped to Asia, and that could be Hong Kong or China, Malaysia, Singapore, Taiwan. I would say about 10% of my crop will remain here in Canada. We have been very conscious to try and promote an, an on-farm market experience and build the value at the farm gate. Heeman's Hard Cider is available exclusively on the farm. And again, one of the goals with cider production and retail is to help build the, build the beverage industry in rural Ontario and to provide a, a unique farm experience for people to want to come out and invest in their local community. I do kind of all southwestern Ontario. I go as far as Owen Sound. Let's see, probably 65 or 70 percent of my customers are hog farmers and then the rest are dairy or dairy goats or a couple chicken guys. In Ontario there's two other roasters right now. There, there's some other ones but they don't really market as doing custom roasting. So there's two main competitors I guess. Just the fact that our dairy farm is certified organic is probably different than most people. Province-wide, uh, there's about 3,400 dairy farms and 82 are organic. We're already at the point we're producing 1% of Ontario's organic milk here, and we've got a chance to grow on that market too. If we were just doing conventional dairy, we'd be a drop in the bucket. It wouldn't really mean anything. We used to have dairy, and there's just some unfortunate events that happened in the dairy, so we decided we wanted to stay with the quota system. So we thought turkeys would be a good option, and we went with that. We use a lot less fertilizer because we have the turkey manure. No fertilizer on a lot of crops because the turkey manure is so good. So that helps the environment because it's not a synthetic product. We're continuously trying to cut down our, our pesticide program. We've gone to other items, biological applications, we apply that to the ginseng, hoping that we can reduce our pesticide levels. Compaction is always high in my mind, so I'm careful about uh, running with heavy loads and, and numerous trips. Having half our land in hay, I think, is really good for the environment. We obviously have no tillage on those fields every year, and when we plant hay fields, it's usually down for five or six years, so that's as good a cover crop as you can get almost every time when we take out a hay field, it's like we're starting with virgin land again. I found that beekeeping is one way that allows you to have a greater appreciation for all parts of the land. There's too much opportunity in what we have on our landscape not, not to learn from that. And I've, I found that it's helped me be a better manager of our other crops by understanding some of those natural cycles, A, in the plants, but also in insect biology. The last seven, eight years I've been seeding a crop after the wheat of oats or rye or peas or oilseed radish and, and just been experimenting with different uh, varieties of that. It improves the soil conditions and soil health. It also gives me an opportunity to spread some manure before the cover crop starts to grow. I got started with the, the MFA as the junior farmer rep between Middlesex Junior Farmers and the Middlesex Federation of Agriculture. And I was going to the meetings as a liaison between the two organizations. I really enjoyed the meetings and everything that was talked about. Everything was very relevant. And I found that I could learn a lot of things there that would further myself. The most valuable thing I get from MFA, I would say, is the connections within the board. Talking to other guys in the area that are farming, the ways that they're doing things, or things doing a little differently that you can apply to your own farm and see if it helps you or not. There's so much that you can learn from talking to people after meetings and during coffee times and, and having a drink after. There's, there's so much knowledge that you can gain from people uh, that, that isn't official. I think I add a different perspective. A, a lot of different county federations are older and I like to think that I can bring a, a different mindset or a different viewpoint on a lot of issues. I think the Federation is stronger when you have a more diverse set of beliefs coming to the table. There's a lot more governing than I thought goes on uh, at the municipal level that we kind of 
not necessarily look after, but uh, voice our opinions and stuff on. So I learned a lot about that. The MFA has been instrumental in the creation of Alice Middlesex, which has been a, a vital platform for helping invest in agriculture and healthy ecosystems. And again, that, that would not have been possible if it wasn't for the resources and support of the Middlesex Federation. And that's a tool that is, is helping us to make significant further investments in our healthy landscape on this farm. MFA benefits farmers by being a, a united voice to stand up for the issues. Without a federation, I think it'd be a lot harder for farmers to mobilize and stand up for their issues. So OFA goes to lobby the provincial government, make recommendations on laws to help farmers. I think the MFA is evolving into an education organization as much to educate urban folks or non-agricultural people as, as it was when it started to be a lobby group. And, and I think we can gain more by passing the correct message along than we can by dealing with people that we already know that already do know the message. We've started the Ag Night at the Races, which is an opportunity for urban and rural folks to get together and, and have a visit and, and just overall interact. And, and I think that's a very positive thing. The most beneficial things I find about the Middlesex Federation of Agriculture is uh, affiliation with the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, uh, which has got a huge lobby group. Me as an individual farmer is not prepared to bring issues to the government levels or to large corporations such as Union Gas, Hydro One, etc. The thing I like about the OFA is it's the largest voice of farmers. Like, if you're going to lobby the government, you want to have as large and united a voice as you can. The OFA represents 38,000 farm families across the province. That's, that's a big number. We're the biggest organization in, in Ontario, and the staff that we have and, and the resources that we have is, is a positive thing for Middlesex farmers.